Bo said you'd hold out just to be annoying, said Bo's lieutenant. Bo understands you. I thought he's frightened. That was supposed to be an insult, Bo's understanding, and he can't pull it off. And then I thought I must be imagining things. Vampire voices are as weird as vampire emotion and as unreadable as vampire faces. Hell, I can't even tell the, the boy vampires from the girl vampires. How do I know what vampire fear sounds like? If vampires feel fear, but the thought repeated, he's frightened. I remembered how reluctant they'd seemed last night bringing me here. Let's get it over with, Bo's lieutenant had said. I remembered how they didn't want to get too close to their guest, and how they did most of their talking from near the door, further than his chain would stretch, how the vampire who'd helped me had dropped me and run, when he realized his friends were leaving him behind. Is she still sane, though, Connie? It's harder if you keep them till they've gone mad, you know, and the blood's not as sweet. Bo finds this very disappointing, as I'm sure you do, but that's the way humans are. You wouldn't want to waste what we brought you, would you? They were all standing just beyond the chandelier, so not quite halfway across the room. They had fanned out into a ragged semicircle. As Bo's lieutenant spoke, he took an ambling step toward us. The others fanned out a little more. My poor, weary heart was beating desperately, hopelessly, in my throat again. This reminded me of any human gang cornering its victim, and however wary they were of Bo's guest, they were still twelve to one, and the one was chained to the wall with ward signs stamped all over the shackle. I couldn't help myself. I curled my stretched out legs under me. I wanted to cross my arms in front of my breast, but I reminded myself that this was useless. Just as curling my legs up was useless, so I compromised and leaned on one hand and left the other one in my lap. I managed not to squeeze it into a fist, although this wasn't easy. The vampires, all except the one sitting against the wall next to me, took another slow, floating, apparently aimless step forward. I was pressing my back so hard against the wall my spine hurt. I wished I knew what was going on. Why were Bo and his guests old enemies? But then, even if I did know what was going on, how would that help me? What I wanted, to get out alive, didn't seem one of the options. So I might as well distract myself with wanting to know what was going on. They didn't want to get too close, but they were still moving closer. I couldn't think of any reason this could be good news. I never saw it coming this time either. They were vampires. I heard Bo's lieutenant saying, as if his words were coming from some other universe, Perhaps you just need a little encouragement, Connie. The words happened, seemed to happen at human speed. Presumably that was because he wanted me to hear them. In the universe where my body was, I was picked up, and something sharp sliced high across my breast, just below the collarbones, above the neckline of my dress. And I was then thrown down, and my face banged into something hard, and I felt my lips split. I heard, since you don't seem to like feet, and the goblin giggle from last night. And then they were gone. And I was lying across my fellow captive's lap. The cut in my breast had been so quick that it was only starting to hurt. The cut, I was bleeding, bleeding fresh, warm red blood all over a half-starved vampire. I felt his hands on my bare shoulders. I snatched myself away at what was no doubt good speed for a human. He let me go. I slid backward on my knees, skidding on my slippery red skirt, clutching at my front, feeling the blood sliding through my fingers, dripping on the floor, leaving a blood trail, a pool, more blood oozing from my lip, leaking down my chin. He still hadn't moved, but this time when I felt him looking at me, I had to look back. I had to look into his eyes, into eyes green as emeralds, as green as the stones in my grandmother's awful ring. You can stop me or any vampire if your will is strong enough. I felt my hands fall, tumble from my breast. I leaned forward. I was going to crawl toward him. I was kneeling in my own blood, smearing it across the floor as I crept toward him. My blood was spattered on his naked chest, across one arm, the arm with the wheel on it. Don't look, look, look into his eyes, vampire eyes, if your will is strong enough. Desperately, I tried to think of anything, anything, my grandmother's ring, which was the color of these eyes, my grandmother, sunlight is your element. But it was darkness here, darkness barely lessened by candlelight. The candlelight was only there so that my weak human eyes could be more easily drawn 
by mesmeric vampire eyes. But I remember but I remember light, real light, daylight, sunlight. Hey sunshine, I am sunshine, sunshine is my name. I remembered a song Charlie used to sing. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. I heard him singing it. No, I heard me singing it, thin, wavering with no discernible tune. But it was my voice. The light in the green eyes snapped off and I fell backward as if I'd been dropped. I turned and scuttled for my corner. I burrowed under my blanket and I stayed there. I must have slept again. Silly thing to do. Was there a sensible thing to do? Perhaps I fainted. I woke suddenly, knowing it was 4 a.m. and time to go make cinnamon rolls, but this time when I woke, I knew at once where I was. I was still in that ballroom, still chained to that wall. I was still alive. I was so tired. I sat up. It would be dawn soon. The candles had burned out while I slept, but there was dim gray light coming through the windows. I could see some pink starting on the horizon, I sighed. I didn't want to turn around and look at him. I knew he was still sitting in the middle of the wall. I knew he hadn't moved. I knew it as I knew that Bo's gang had been frightened. The blood from my split lip had stuck my mouth together, and when I licked it unstuck and yawned, it split again, with a sharp rip of pain that made my eyes water. Damn. I touched my breast dubiously. It was clotted and sticky. The slash had been high, where it was only skin over bone. I hadn't, after all, lost much blood, although it was a long gash and messy. I didn't want to turn around. He had let me go last night. He had remembered that he didn't want Bo to win. Perhaps my singing had sounded like the singing of a rational creature, but the sight of my blood had almost been too much for him. I didn't want to show him my front again. Maybe the scab would be too much of a come on. I sucked at my lip. With my back to him wrapped in my blanket, I watched the sun rise. It was going to be another brilliant day. Good. I needed sunlight now, but I also needed as many hours as possible before sunset. How long could I afford to wait? Charlie would be brewing the coffee by now. The sun was bright on the water of the lake. This would have to do. I stood up and dropped my blanket. If the vampire had been telling the truth, I was safe from him now till sunset. I turned around and looked at the sunlight coming in the two windows I had to choose from. For no explicable reason, I preferred the window nearer him. I avoided looking at him. I stepped into the block of friendly sunlight and knelt down. I pulled my little jackknife from my bra and held it between my two hands. Fingers extended, palms together as if I was praying. I suppose I was. I hadn't tried to change anything in 15 years. I'd only ever done it with my grandmother, and after she'd gone, I'd stopped. I stopped. Perhaps I was unsettled by what I had done to her ring. Perhaps I was angry with her for leaving, even though the wars had started, and lots of people were being separated from members of their families as travel and communication became increasingly erratic, and in some areas broke down completely. The postcards from my father stopped during the wars, but I knew my grand loved me, knew that she wouldn't have left me again if she hadn't had to. I still stopped trying to do the things she taught me. It was as if our time by the lake was a different life. My life away from the lake, away from my grand, was the life my mother had chosen for me, in which my father's heritage did not exist. Although I went to school with several kids from important magic-handling families, and some of them liked to show off what they could do, I was never really tempted. I oohed and awed with the ordinary kids, and my last name, Charlie's last name, gave nothing away. By the time the wars ended, I was a teenager, and perhaps I'd convinced myself that the games by the lake with my grand had only been children's games, and if I remembered anything else I was dreaming, or the hypes or trippers I'd had, had been unusually good. It's not as though my grand ever came back and reminded me otherwise. But my grand was right about my heritage not going away because everyone was pretending it didn't exist. I hadn't been near that place, that somewhere inside me, for 15 years. But when I went back there that morning, kneeling in the sunshine, it wasn't just there it had changed. Grown. It was as if what my grand had done, what we had done together, was plant a sapling. It didn't matter to the sapling that we'd then gone away and left it. It went on with becoming a tree. 
My heritage was the soil it had grown in. But I had never done anything this difficult, and I hadn't done anything at all in 15 years. Did you really never forget how to ride a bicycle? If you could ride a bicycle, could you ride a super mega four turbocharged several million something or other motorcycle, the kind you can hear from six blocks away that you'd have to stand on tiptoe to straddle the first time you tried? I felt the power gathering below the nape of my neck between my shoulder blades. That place on my back burned as if the sunlight I nailed in was too strong. There was an unpleasant sense of pressure building, like the worst case of heartburn you can imagine, and then it exploded and shot down my arms in fiery threads, and there was an almost audible clunk. Or maybe it was audible. I opened my hands. My arms felt as weak as if I'd lifted a boulder. There was a key lying in my right palm. You're a magic handler, a transmuter, said the vampire in that strange voice I no longer always found expressionless. I heard him being surprised. Not much of one, I said, a small stuff changer only. The kids from the magic handling families taught the rest of us some of the slang. Calling a transmuter a stuff changer was pretty insulting. Almost as bad as calling a sorcerer a charm twister. I thought you couldn't look at me in sunlight. The sound and smell of magic were too strong to ignore, and your body is shading your hands, he said. I extended the foot with the shackle on it. This was the real moment. My heart was beating as if there was a vampire in the room. Ha ha ha. My hand was shaking badly, but I found the odd little keyhole, fumbled my new key in it, and turned it. Click. Well done, he whispered. I looked out the window. It was maybe 7 o'clock. I had about 12 hours. I was already exhausted, but I would be running for my life. How far could adrenaline get me? I had a vague but practical idea where I was. The lake itself was a great orienter. All I had to do was keep it on my right, and I would come to where I'd left my car eventually. Probably 20 miles if I remembered the shape of the shore correctly. If I stayed close to the lake, I could avoid the bad spot behind the house, and I would have to hope there weren't any other bad spots between me and my car that I couldn't get around. Would I be able to change my shackle key into a car key? I doubted the vampires would have folded up my discarded clothing with the key in the jeans pocket and left it for me on the driver's seat. Surely I could do 20 odd miles in 12 hours, even after the two nights and a day I'd just had. I turned to the vampire. I looked at him for the first time that day, for the first time since I'd blood on him. He had shut his eyes again. I stepped out of the sunlight and his eyes opened. I stepped toward him, kneeled down beside him. I felt his eyes drop I felt his eyes drop to my bloody breast. My blood on his chest had crusted. He hadn't tried to wipe it off or lick it up. Give me your ankle, I said. There was a long pause. Why? he said at last. I don't like bullies, I said. Honor among thieves. Take your pick. He shook his head slowly. It is... There was an even longer pause. It is a kind thought. I wondered what depths he'd had the plum to come up with the word kind. But it is no use. Bows folk encircle this place. The size of the clear area around this house is precisely the size of the area. Bow things can be kept close guarded. He will not be wrong about this. You will be able to pass that ring now in daylight while all sane vampires are shielded and in repose. But the moment I can move out of this place, so will my guards be moving. And you aren't, of course, at your best and brightest, I added silently. I stood up and stepped back into the sunlight and felt it on my skin and thought about the big tree where a tiny sapling used to be. There are a lot of trees and tree symbolism and the magic done to ward or contain the others because trees are impervious to dark magic. And then I thought about traps and trapped things and about when the evil of the dark was clearly evil and when it was not quite so, so clearly evil. There was a very long pause while I felt the sunlight soaking through my skin, soaking into the tree that up till a few minutes ago I hadn't known was there. Felt the leaves of my tree unfurl, stretch like tiny hands to take it in. I was tired, I was scared, I was stupefied. I'd just done an important piece of magic, 
I was tranced out. I thought I heard a wind in the leaves of my tree, and the wind had a voice, and it said, yes. Then you'll have to come with me, I said. There was another silence, but when he spoke, his voice struck at me as if it might itself draw blood. Do not torment me, he said, as I have been merciful to you, as merciful as I can be. Do not tease me now. Go and live. Go. I looked down at him. He was not looking at me, but then I was standing in the sunlight again. I stepped out of the sunlight, but he still did not look at me. I'm sorry, I said. I'm not teasing you. If you will not let me try to shackle on your ankle, give me your hand instead. I held my hand out, down, toward him, still sitting cross-legged on the floor. More priceless sunlit moments passed. Would you rather die or whatever, like a rat in a trap, I said more harshly than I meant. I haven't noticed you getting any better offers. I didn't see him move, of course. He was just standing there, standing beside me, his hand in my hand. It was the first time I had seen him standing. His hand felt as inhuman as the rest of him looked. The right shape and everything, but all wrong. Wrong in some fathomless, indefinable, turning the world on its end way. Also, there was the smell. Standing beside him, it was almost overwhelming. Mind you, he smelled a lot better than I did. I needed a bath like you don't want to imagine. There isn't much that stinks worse than fear. But he didn't smell human. He didn't smell animal or vegetable or mineral. He smelled vampire. I took a deep breath anyway. Then I stepped back into the sunlight, still holding his hand, drawing it after me. His arm unbent and let me do it. The sunlight struck his hand halfway up the wheeled forearm. Some subtle change occurred. Subtle but profound, the feeling of his hand in mine was no longer a, a threat to everything that made me human. The hand became a, an undertaking, an enterprise, a piece of work. Maybe not that much different from flour and water and yeast and a rapidly approaching deadline of hungry, focused customers. I felt the power moving through me. It did not come in fiery threads this time, but in slow, fat, curly ripples. The ripples made me feel a little peculiar, as if there was an actual thing or things moving around in my insides, shouldering my liver and stomach aside, twisting among my bowels. I tried to relax and let the, the ripples wiggle and squirm as they wished. I had to know if I could do this, do what I was offering to do for a long time, possibly till sunset, possibly 12 hours or more. Could I bear this invasion that long, even though I was inviting it? What if I overestimated my strength, like a diver overestimating how long she could hold her breath? I was demented. The most impressive thing I had ever done before today was turn a very pretty ring into an ugly botch, and I would have this vampire's or life totally in my hands. I was trying to save the life of a vampire. The ripples spread through me, first balancing themselves cautiously like kids standing on a teeter-totter, then slowly, gently finding spaces where they could settle themselves down on various bits of my inner anatomy, like the last customers during the early breakfast rush finding the last available seats. Most of me was already full of things like heart and spleen and kidneys, but there were gaps where the power could fit itself in, attach itself to its surroundings, tap into me. I felt very full. As the connections were made, as the power made itself at home, the ripples began to change. Now they felt like the straps of a harness being settled in place. Buckles let out a little here, taken in a little there. When they were done, it felt like a good fit. I thought I could do it. I sighed. I could no longer see my tree because I had become it, embodied it. It grew in me, it sapped my blood, its branches my limbs. The power wrapped round it like ropes and cables, flew from its bowels like banners and streamers. Perhaps the next time there was wind in my hair, it would rustle like leaves. Yes. I held out my right hand, and he put his left hand into it. I drew him, all the rest of him, into the bright rectangle in front of the window. Vampire skin looks like hell in sunlight, by the way. Maybe bursting into flames is to be preferred. Anyway, I felt my harness take its load. The pool was steady and even, the weight heavy but bearable, I hoped. 
Okay, I said, back up again. I want both hands free to get that shackle off, and um, we'll need to stay in contact while we um, do the sunlight thing. I didn't know vampires were ever clumsy. I thought Grace came with the territory, like fangs and a complexion that looks really bad in daylight. They're always oily, 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 supple in the books, but he staggered back into the shadow, leaned against the wall with a thump, dropped my hands, dropped his own hands to butt against the wall next to him. What in creation are you, he said. This is no small stuff, stuff changer trick. It is not possible. It is not possible. I have been standing in sunlight, and I know it is not possible. It was nice to know I wasn't the only one of us feeling demented. I knelt to get at his shackle. I was relieved when the key worked for his cuff, too. I guess I was going to have to be pretty careful of my strength to be a successful sun parasol for the undead for the next 12 hours. I was not thinking about any more of the implications of my offer than I had to. The main thing, the only thing, was I couldn't leave him behind. I didn't care who or what he was. I couldn't walk out of this cage and leave some caged thing behind me. If I could help it, and for better or worse, I could, apparently. The skin of his ankle looked terrible. I couldn't tell if the peeling was anything more than just chafing. I was careful not to touch it. My ankle didn't seem any the worse for wear, but there hadn't been any anti-human wards on my shackle that I'd noticed. Oh yes, they exist. They're not a lot talked about among humans, but they exist. What are you? Who are you? He repeated. What family are you from? I broke the cuff open. My name is Ray Seddon, but what you're looking for is Raven Blaze. Seddon is Charlie's name, my stepfather's name, but my mother stopped me using Raven or Blaze as soon as we left my dad. You're a Blaze, he said, still leaning against the wall but staring down at me as I knelt at his feet. Which Blaze? My father is Onyx Blaze, I said. Onyx Blaze had no children, barked the vampire. Had, I said, just as sharply, do you know he is dead? The vampire shook his head impatiently, but then went on shaking it again and again, as if bothered by gnats. Gnats might like vampires, they go for blood, but I didn't think that was the problem here. I don't know, I don't know, he disappeared. Fifteen years ago, I said. The vampire looked at me, Onyx Blaze had, has no children. How do you know, I wanted to say. Is my dad another of your old enemies, or your old friends? No, no. I hadn't seen him since I was six, but I couldn't believe that of my grandson. He has at least one, I said. The vampire slid slowly down the wall to sit on the feet next to me. He started to laugh. Vampires don't laugh very well, or at least this one didn't. He half looked, sounded, like something out of a bad horror film, the sort of horror film that isn't scary because you don't believe it. It's so crude. Where was their special effects budget and half didn't? The second half was like the worst horror film you'd ever seen, the one that made you think about things you'd never imagined, the one that scared you so much you threw up. This was worse than the Goblin Giggler, my second guard from Bo's gang. I clamped my hands around the empty shackle and waited for him to stop. A blaze, he said. Bo's lot bought me, brought me a blaze, and not just a third cousin who can do card tricks and maybe write a ward sign that almost works. But Onyx Blaze's daughter, he stopped laughing. Then I decided maybe silence was worse after all, at least when it followed that laughter. Your father didn't educate you very well. If I had killed you and had your blood, the blood of Onyx Blaze's daughter, the blood of someone who can do what you just did, I could have snapped that shackle as if the steel were paper and the marks on it no more than a, a recipe for cinnamon rolls and taken the odds against me with Bo's gang. Even after the weeks I've been here, even against all the others you haven't seen, silent in the woods watching, and I would have won. 
That's what the blood of someone from one of the families can do. In a blaze, the effect doesn't last a week at the most, but a lot can be done in a few nights. He sounded almost dreamy. On Onyx Blaze's daughter's blood, I could get rid of Bo for good. I still could. All I would have to do is keep you here one more day and wait till sunset. I'm weak and sick, and I see double in this damn daylight, but I'm still stronger than a human. All I would have to do is keep you here. His voice trailed off. I didn't move. There was a small wispy thought in the back of my mind. It seemed to be something like, oh well. A little closer to consciousness, there was a slightly more definite thought. And it said, well, we've been here before several times in the last couple of days. We're either going to lose for good now, or we aren't. I sat very still, as if I were trying to discourage a cobra from striking. More minutes of sunlight streamed past us toward nightfall. At last, he said, but I am not going to. I suppose I am not going to for some reason similar to whatever insane reason has made you decide to free me and take me with you. What happens when your power comes to its end in five minutes or five hours? Well, I know that the fire is swift. I moved, slowly, distracted in spite of everything. By that I know. Not I believe or I guess, but I know. Something else not to think about. I continued to move very slowly, took my hands off the empty shackle, slid the key into my bra again. It could stay a shackle key for now. I guess I'm going to make a playlist for this at some point. So I had to write down some of the songs. Okay. Uh, or type down. I was not perhaps fully convinced that the cobra had lowered its hood. I felt his eyes on me again. I did warn you that names have power, he said. Even human names. Although this was not what I was thinking of when I said it. I'll remember not to tell any vampires my father's name in the future, I said. I glanced out the window. We'd lost about half an hour since I'd made the key. I shivered. My glance fell on my corner. The sack looked plumper than it had when I last looked, before Bo's gang had come the second time. More supplies, presumably. I would need feeding to get me through this day, although I didn't at all feel like eating now and neither of us had pockets to carry anything in. I went over to the sack and picked it up, another loaf of bread, another bottle of water, and something heavy in a plastic bag. I pulled the heavy thing out, heavy and squishy, a big lump of red bleeding meat. I gave a squeak and dropped it on the floor, where it obligingly went splat. The vampire said it is beast, cow, beef, I believe they have forgotten to cook it for you. I don't like cooked meat either, I said, backing away from it. I, I, no thanks. Or would it do you any good? Another of his pauses. Yes, he said. It's all yours, I said. I'll stick to bread. I saw him this time. Did he mean for me to be able to see him? Was it hard for him to move in daylight, even early in the morning and in shade? Or was he merely luxuriating and being free from the chain? Or had he moved so little in the last however many days and nights that even he felt a little stiff. He walked as slowly as a weary human might walk around the big rectangle of light on the floor, around it to my corner, although he still walked with a sinuousness no human had. He bent and picked up the drippy parcel. I thought, is he going to suck it dry or what? I didn't see. It was like when he drank water. One moment there was water, the next moment there was not. One moment there was a big piece of bloody meat in a white plastic bag, and the next moment the white plastic bag, ripped open, was drifting toward the floor and the meat had disappeared. Vampires sometimes like their blood with a few solids, I guess. Maybe it was like having rice with your curry or pasta with your sauce. I decided against trying to tie the sack round me somehow and ate most of the new lo loaf instead, although... 
It tasted like dust and ashes, not wholly because it was more store-bred. I spared a, be a brief thought about how vampires might go shopping for human groceries. Groceries for humans, that is. Then I picked up the water bottle. It would come with us. We had to get going. We were leaving. We were on our way. We were going now, and I was scared out of my mind. What had I, what had I let myself in for? The mere thought of remaining in constant physical contact with a vampire was abhorrent. And he was right. What about when whatever it was ran out? But I couldn't force him to come with me. He had decided it was worth the risk. So how fast was the fire anyway, supposing it came to that? I didn't need an answer to that, not fast enough. Nothing like as fast as a nice clean beheading. And if you're touching a vampire when he catches fire, okay, okay, wait, said a little voice in my head. How did you get here? You got here by making the best of a whole Carthaginian hell of a series of bad choices. And remember, he doesn't feel horrible when you're doing your son parasol trick. He feels more like helping Charlie do the books when Mom's sick or dealing with Mr. Cagney. Mr. Cagney was one of our regulars at the coffee house, and he was convinced that the rest of the world existed to give him a bad time. He was the only one of our regulars who couldn't manage to say anything nice about my cinnamon rolls. That didn't stop him from eating them, however, and listening to him complain on a day he had arrived too late and they were sold out had resulted in our always having one set aside for him. Dealing with Mr. Cagney was an effort, a big, tiring, thankless effort. On the whole, I thought I preferred the vampire. He was watching me. You can change your mind. Then he said something that sounded almost human for the first time. I half wish you would. I shook my head mournfully. No, I can't. Then there is one more thing, he said. I was beginning to learn that I probably wouldn't like anything he said after one of his pauses. I waited. You will have to let me carry you till we are well away from here. What? Blood spore. Your feet will be bleeding again before we are halfway across the open area. Was there the faintest tremor in his oddly echoey voice when he said that? Mine will not, and those folk will not be at all happy about our escape tonight when they discover it. They will find the trail at once if they have blood spore to follow. I lay it on a pause of my own. Are you telling me that if I had decided to leave you behind, I wouldn't have made it anyway? I do not know. There might conceivably have been some reason you were able to escape. A faulty lock on the shackle, for example. Bo would have... Someone's, someone would pay severely for this, but it might end there. That we are both gone will mean that something truly extraordinary has happened. And it almost certainly has something to do with you, as it does, does it not? And that therefore something important about you was overlooked. And Bo will like that even less that and, and Bo will like that even less than he would have liked the straightforward escape of an ordinary human prisoner. He will order his folk to follow. We must not make it easy for them. This was the longest speech I had heard from him. It edged out his description of the super sucker he would have become on the blood of Onyx Blaze's daughter. From a creature who is driven mad by daylight, you are making very good sense. Having an accomplice is reviving, any hope after no hope, even in these somewhat daunting circumstances. Daunting, I liked that too. That was as good as clean of live things. He moved toward me and held out his arms slowly as if trying not to scare me. There was a sudden ghastly rush of adrenaline. My body was having some trouble keeping up with my mind's mercurial decisions. And I twitched myself sideways like I was moving a puppet. I put one arm around his neck carefully so I didn't stretch the dubiously clotted scab on my breast and held the water bottle in my other hand. He bent and picked me up more easily than I pick up a tray of cinnamon rolls. It was not going to be a comfortable ride. It was rather like sitting on the striped frame of a chair that has had all the chair bits taken away. There are just a few nasty pieces of iron railing left and they start digging railing shaped holes into you at once. Also, if this was a chair, it was made for some other species to sit in. Vampires do breathe, by the way, but their chests don't move like humans. Have you ever lain in the arms of your sweetheart and tried to match your breathing to his or hers? You do it automatically. 
Your brain only gets involved if your body is having trouble. Fortunately, there was nothing about this situation that was like being in the arms of a sweetheart, except that I was leaning against someone's naked chest. I could no more have breathed with him than I could have ignited gasoline and shot exhaust out my butt because I was sitting in the passenger seat of a car. I also had the weird sensation that he'd been several degrees cooler when he picked me up, and he'd matched his body temperature to mine. Speaking of matching, we left by the door Bo's gang had brought me through, across the ghostly hall, and out through the front door, which had been conveniently left ajar. What did I know about vampire deliberateness? I could barely recognize my vampire's breathing as breathing, but I had a notion that he walked not merely without hesitation, but very deliberately into the blast of sunshine at the foot of the porch, and turned left toward the trees on that side. I felt my harness take the strain. If there had been real straps involved, they would have creaked. It was a long way to the edge of the wood. It was perhaps just as well he was carrying me. The heat of the sun seemed to be making me woozy. Heat doesn't usually trouble me. One of the reasons Charlie had first let me help him with the baking when I was still small was because I was the only one of any of us who could stand the heat of it in the summer, including the rest of the staff. That was when Charlie's was still fairly small itself, and Charlie was doing most of the cooking. Before he opened up the front so we so we could have tables as well as the counter and the booths along the wall, and before he built my bakery. The bakery now is its own room next to the main kitchen, and there are windows and an outside door and industrial strength fans, but in July and August, pretty much everyone but me has to get out of there and splash water on themselves and have a sit down. But this was something else. The big curly ripples of power I'd felt when we stood in front of the window seemed bigger and curlier than ever and were slowing the rest of me down, taking up too much space themselves, squeezing the usual bits of me into corners till I felt squashed, like someone in a commuter train at 6 p.m. Even my brain felt compressed. That sense of wearing some kind of harness that had also managed to nail itself into my major organ systems was still there. But I began to feel that it wasn't so much carrying the burden as holding me together so that the power ripples knew where the edges, the edges of we, were, and didn't break anything. I didn't feel frightened, although I wondered if I should. We reached the edge of the trees at last, and it was better at once in their shadow. I felt more alert and lighter somehow, although I wouldn't have described the effect of the ripples as heavy. But that feeling of having all my gaps filled a little too full eased somewhat. I remembered what he'd said about daylight. I feel as if the rays of your sun are prizing me apart. The tree shadow wasn't thick or reliable enough to protect us from the sun, so the power was still moving through me. But I didn't feel I was about to overflow or crack. I thought, okay, I can guard one vampire from the effects of bright, direct daylight. I wouldn't be able to guard two. Not that this was a piece of information I was planning on needing often in the future. We've crossed their line, said the vampire. The guard ring is behind us. They'll know we have, won't they? They'll know tonight. We do not pay attention to the daylit world. Will they know where? Perhaps, but I'm following the traces from when they brought me here, and so far it is the same way they brought you. And without, and without fresh blood, they will have trouble deciding what is old and what is new. Uh, this wasn't a topic I was looking forward to bringing up. You know, you and I are both uh, wearing quite a lot of my uh, blood already uh, crusted from last night. That matters very little, said the vampire. It is only blood hot from a live body when it touches the earth that leaves a clear sign. I reminded myself this was good news. He was silent for a while, and then he said this passionately as ever. I had feared that even if you could, as you claimed, protect my body from the fire as we crossed the open space, that the sun would blind me. This did not happen. I am relieved. Oh, gods, I said. As you say, but as you said earlier, I did not see myself receiving any better offers either. It seemed to me worth even that price against the almost certain likelihood of annihilation at Bo's hands. I said fascinated against my better judgment. You thought I could navigate you through the trees somehow? Yes, I would not have been totally helpless. I can detect the presence of solid objects, but it would not have been easy. 